Well, you might like to keep your Bibles open to that last section of Philippians, although what we're doing this morning is touching on that text, but really uh, giving a summary of the whole book of Philippians. And if you just come in this morning and you're just catching this tail end, uh, I hope it's helpful and you can catch our previous talks uh, on, on our website. So let's pray as we come to God's Word. And Father, we thank you that we can open this book of Philippians for the last time uh, at the moment. Uh, we pray that you would speak to us clearly, uh, convict us of what we know to mature in Christ. Amen. Well, I've got a confession to make and I want you to keep it a secret. I miss my pre-internet brain. Those were the days when I did my own thinking without too much outside help. In the good old days, I didn't have a mobile phone and I was completely free of that mind-numbing technology. Now my phone is an extension of my brain and I wouldn't like to hazard a guess as to which one is smarter. I have chat GPT to answer my questions. Uh, once I did arithmetic in my head, now when I need to do a sum, I pull out my calculator and do it on my phone. Uh, when I need a torch to walk to the shed each night and dispose of the cat, I speak into my phone, hey Google, turn flashlight on. And when the cat's duly dealt with, I'm back at the house, once again I speak into, into my phone, hey Google, turn flashlight off. And it turns my flashlight off, and in fact my... <laughs> my my um, tablet's doing strange things now. See, now I call my torch a flashlight. I receive email after email and it's ruining my brain. Facebook sends my mind into overload. So I decided to do something about it. I just wasn't going to sit around and let these things happen. I decided I needed to do some brain exercises. Imagine that. I've always been interested in speed reading, so I enrolled in a speed reading course by Jim Quick, who is an expert in this area. Uh, Jim not only teaches you how to read well, but he teaches you how to learn well. So for 21 days, I put myself through a speed reading course and learned how to read faster and more effectively. You know, the guy that wants me to read quicker is a guy called Quick. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Jim seems like a delightful fellow, and he really is a great motivator, and I got through those 21 days. And at the end of the course, he gives some tips on how to learn, on how to keep going, how to keep reading quicker when the course is finished. The second last day, he calls levels of transformation, and he goes on to give some principles which can be applied to any sort of transformation. And as Christians, we're in the business of transformation, for we are in the business of becoming more like Christ. So as we come to the end of Philippians, we want to take what we've read, and we don't want it to be the end, we want it to be the beginning of the letter in our lives. So how do we take what we've heard, and prayerfully, I guess under the prompting of the Spirit, of course, how do we take what we've heard and deliberately decide to grow to be more like Christ? How do we become more engaged in the mission of the church? How do I love my neighbour more than I've ever done before? So much so that I'll share the gospel with them and I'll share in Christ's sufferings even when he calls me to do so. How do I deliberately put in the practice what I've heard throughout this letter? What about inner change and spiritual renewal? Will you leave this series on Philippians with a clear plan to grow according to God's grace? Well, Quick outlines in his course five levels of transformation which describes personal development. The idea being, as Quick puts it, first you create your habits and then your habits create you. Uh, these five levels of growth were discovered well before modern research, as the Christian clinical psychologist Colleen Hurst points out from time to time, the, the Bible often predates the insights of modern psychology. So what are these five levels of transformation? Uh, they're going to go up on the screen now, thank you. You'll see them there, that the highest level is level one, identity, then level two, beliefs and values, level three, capabilities, 
level four behaviour, level five environment. Just need to digest that for a moment, don't you? Friends, when we read a letter such as Philippians, we might well be tempted to rush straight in and change our behaviour and that's a good thing to do, but often it only lasts for a short time, then we fall back into our old habits. You know, New Year's resolutions are a typical example. These five levels of transformation are found in this letter because, unsurprisingly, God knows what he's doing. He knows how to bring about change in the whole person. Our behaviour won't change unless the whole of us changes under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer is, is that you can see that God not only commands us to grow, but he provides the means and the resources so that we really can grow into the mindset of Christ Jesus. As Paul says in Philippians 2.5, put on the same mind, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. And that is our goal and that is our aim. And we need to plan to do that. So let's start with behaviour. Get that next slide up. Behaviour is where we normally start. Usually when we think of change, we go straight to behaviour. The alcoholic wants to change their behaviour and stop drinking. The smoker wants to stop smoking. The gambler uh, wants to stop betting. The shopper wants to stop spending too much money. The athlete wants to run quicker, the salesperson wants to increase his sales and get better and to change, the academic wants to write better papers, the student wants to pass the exams, parents want to learn habits which improve their parenting skills, Christians want to grow in holiness. And if we think about holiness only in terms of what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing, we reduce the Christian life to a series of do's and don'ts. Oh, even though in Philippians there are lots of things to do and lots of things not to do. Paul lays that out before us. There are 14 commands which call us to change our behaviour. So there are things we should be doing and there are things we shouldn't be doing. But to see only commands in this letter is to distort the letter. The Bible's news is bigger and better than instructions. So don't reduce Philippians to a bunch of laws which define the Christian life. For the message of Philippians is Christ the person himself. Don't treat the Bible as an instruction manual. Treat the gospel as a lifesaver, as a life preserver. The do's can never be detached from the done of the finished work of Christ. So Paul consistently links our behaviour to the gospel which brings about spiritual transformation, no more so than we see in chapter 1 verse 27 where Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves, that's behaviour, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So Paul links our behaviour with the gospel. Our behaviour flows from the gospel. And if it does not, if we simply think in terms of behaviour, we drop into legalism. If we leave Christ, what remains is law and we reduce God to sort of being this unkind schoolmaster who stands over us. And friends, the sad thing about casual Christianity is that it focuses on behaviour and nothing else because it lacks spirituality. So don't be a casual Christian. The gospel will guard our hearts and minds because Jesus is Lord over the whole person. He is Lord over the whole of our heart and the whole of our minds. Our, our identity, our beliefs and values, our competencies, our behaviour and environment, we want to be transformed by the um, by the Spirit of God. So we will, according to chapter 1, verse 11, be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. This is what it's about. So that we will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And the goal and the reason and the purpose for our renewal in Christ is not for ourselves. 
but as Paul says, it's to the glory and praise of God. Every ounce of our being in submission to Christ. So we go to level one, identity. When we believe the gospel of grace, God gave us a new identity in Christ. Once we drew our identity from a warped and crooked generation, as we infer from Philippians 2.15 or more directly from Ephesians 2, once we were dead in our transgressions and sins in which, in which we used to live when we followed the ways of this world. See, once our identity was invested in ourselves as we sought to gratify the cravings of our flesh following its thoughts and its desires. And then we heard and we believed the gospel. And then we entered into union with Christ. Now through faith in Christ who has done it all, the old has gone and the new has come. Now we are dead to ourselves. And now we are alive in Christ. Our identity is found in Christ. We exist and live in him. See how this runs through the letter. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1. We are God's holy people in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 3. We glory in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 9. Our righteousness is not of our own, but that which is through faith in Christ. Chapter 3, verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 7, the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, 19, God will meet all our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Are you noticing a pattern there? Not of ourselves, but because we are in Christ Jesus, our righteousness, our joy, our glory, our prize, our peace with God, and all our needs are met in Christ Jesus. And this is the identity that God assigned to you when he forgave you and when he made you into a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, no longer slaves of this world, but slaves of Christ. So make sure you know whose you are. Make sure you know who you belong to. If you were to finish the sentence, I am, if I gave you a bit of paper with I am written on it, what words would you use to finish the sentence? If your sentence doesn't include the idea of being in Christ, then your identity is grounded in something or someone outside of Christ. And then you should ask yourself whether or not God has saved you. For those whom God has forgiven are in Christ. We are in Christ. We belong to Christ. We are slaves of Christ. And so... Who you are is important and our, it drives our beliefs and our values. If you are a Christian or not a Christian or a casual Christian or a lapsed Christian or a lazy Christian, this is reflected in your beliefs and values. We are all theologians. We are all theologians because we all have beliefs which drive our values. The person in Christ finds their security and significance in him. Such a person listens to the word and believes the great commandment and, and wants to live out the great commission to go and make disciples. And this belief translates into a, into a desire to share Jesus with our neighbours. Friends, see, you do the things that you believe in and you prioritise the things that you believe in. And when we cosy up next to Paul in Philippians, we see what he believes in. We see what, Paul, what drives Paul's beliefs and values and what drives his behaviour. He believes the gospel. He loves the church. He witnesses to Jesus wherever he can. He says, of prayer and whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. That's a big statement. 
Paul believes that death is not the end, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And this belief empowers him to share his faith under the most trying of circumstances. Now I find this sobering and I find it confronting. See, we don't live in godly, we don't live in godly obedience because we either don't believe in the lordship of Christ or we don't value the lordship of Christ. Oh, the flip side is much, much better. Oh, I want to know Christ, Paul says in Philippians 3.10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to obtain the resurrection from the dead. And then Paul says to us, if you are mature, if you've got your Christian act together, if you know where you're going, you will think like me. And if you think differently, Paul prays, that God will correct you. Identity, beliefs and values. And then there's capabilities. Level three is capabilities. The person in Christ whose theology is sound and who values the fruit of the Christian life may not be able to do the things that they want to do through lack of skills. See, maybe you know that you are in Christ. You know the lost will perish and you value connecting with other people, but sharing your faith is hard because you don't know how to do it. I don't know what to say. What if I get a hard question? How do I follow up? See, sometimes we need to be trained so to gather the right skills to live out the Christian life, the disciplines of the Christian life, we can call this, the disciplines in evangelism, in prayer, trained to understand the Bible better, learning to live as disciple-making disciples. Friends, small groups are a great place for spiritual growth and for sharpening our skills and our beliefs and our values as we remind ourselves who we are in Christ. It's a life of obedience, not a life of legalism. Know who you are in Christ. Believe and value the gospel and gain ministry skills so that you can live as an effective slave of Christ. And then under behaviour we saw environment. That's level five. Environment. The church is the place where you need to be in order to grow in Christ. And while our individual walk with Christ is absolutely essential, as individuals we live in the context of the church community. The gathering of believers is the basic unit of the Christian life. And so the storyline of Scripture presents God as calling people out of slavery to uh, be a nation belonging to him. Friends, who else will remind you of your identity in Christ if it's not God's people? Who else will teach and preach the Scriptures to build you up in Christ? Who else will open the Scriptures with you and pray with you? Who else will help you apply to God the Gospel to every area of life as we've just done so earlier in this service? To whom are you accountable and who will correct you? See, remember before the Philippian church, Paul brought a pastoral problem, I, Plead with Euodia and Sintuke to be of the same mind in the Lord. Paul put it out there. He put it out into the church community because we are accountable to one another for we are the body of Christ and the health of the members matters. See, who else will encourage you to live out the Christian life if it's not the church? In the final few verses of Philippians, Paul is grateful that the church stood by him in hard times. You'll see it there in 4.14. Paul says, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. 
The Philippians supported Paul when he was abandoned by the churches after he left Macedonia. When he reached Thessalonica, they sent Paul a gift to support and encourage him. And then with Epaphroditus, they sent gifts to the apostle in prison. And Paul says, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Friends, church is about people and always will be about people. A people whom God calls out of slavery to be slaves of his son. A slavery which brings freedom. Called out of this world to be God's holy people, we live as exiles in this land. But the day of Christ is coming. Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the meantime, press on and stand firm. Know whose you are, know and value the gospel and learn how to put into action what you believe. You belong to the church and soon your lowly bodies will be transformed to be like his glorious body. As the songwriter says, and as in a moment we will sing, from the depths of called to the highest heights here we stand the church of the redeemed we are his precious in his sight we stand the church of the redeemed let's pray father we we come before you knowing that once we were in the depths that you have called us to the highest heights and now we stand here as the church of the redeemed. And Father, thank you that you wrote this letter to the Philippians, to the church of the redeemed. And Father, we ask that your gospel in every area, in all these five areas we've considered, will change us and transform us into the image of Jesus. Father, empower us together to become more like Christ. Remind us that our citizenship is in heaven. And Father, give us the clarity to eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.